Okay, we hit 90 people. It's a minute after the hour, so why don't why don't we get started? Uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, to this networking channel event. We've got a really, really exciting hour planned here. Uh, today's topic uh, is an Akamai retrospective living on the edge for a quarter century. And our speaker today is uh, Ramesh Siddharaman. He's currently a distinguished university professor and associate dean for our educational programs and teaching at the College of In the Manning College of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of Massachusetts. Um, Ramesh is really well known for lots of things, uh, but what he's going to be talking about today is his really pioneering work on developing content delivery networks, CDNs, and then shortly after that, edge computing services uh, at Akamai that deliver much of the, you know, much of what we see. On, on the World Wide Web, video, edge applications, and other online services. Um, while Ramesh uh, was at Akamai, he served as principal architect uh, on building the world's first major content delivery network. I'll say that that evolved out of uh, research that was funded by the National Science Foundation, and then also on edge computing services. Um, he's a currently, as I mentioned, a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he has a part-time role continuing as Akamai's chief consulting scientist. So I think with that introduction, uh, Ramesh, we're here to hear about you, to hear about Akamai CDN and edge computing services. So uh, we'll turn things over to you. Before we start, uh, one, one thing to everybody here, uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. There will be an opportunity to continue the discussion on the networking channels uh, Slack and uh, Stavrula, if you could cut and paste that into the, oh, I see it there. Um, there's the Slack channel and Ramesh will be on that channel, I think, after this Ramesh and checking yeah. back in as well. So if there's uh, additional conversations that we want to have, uh, that's where we can have it. So we're going to turn the floor over to Ramesh. There'll be time for conversations at the end. And we do always stop uh, at noontime. Uh, Eastern time sort of on the dot. So with that, Ramesh, thank you so much for being here. And we're looking forward uh, to listening to what you have to say and interacting with you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I hope you can all see my cursor um, and, and you can hear me well. We can um, see your cursor. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the main character in my story, this is going to be story of the edge. Uh, I thought this is a timely story to tell um, uh, because uh, Akamai is turning 25 and the edge is turning 25. Um, and so to start things off, I want to first define what an edge is. Um, so an edge to me is a set of servers deployed pretty much around the globe. Uh, usually it's deployed in clusters. Um, and these clusters could have varying size. You could have clusters with just 10 servers. Uh, you could have clusters with hundreds of servers. Uh, the main characteristic of the edge is that it's ubiquitous and it's also really close to internet clients, um, users, devices around the globe. Uh, in fact, I would say uh, the ideal edge is something that is um, so ubiquitous that any client around the world can find a server that's that's near that client. Um, so how do we define near? You can define it in geographical terms if you want, you know, within five mile radius. But more appropriately, we, we would define it in network terms. For example, we could say it is one AS hop away from clients or it is 10 milliseconds from clients or things like that. Okay, so that's really what an edge is. Uh, I wanna emphasize here, and I'll emphasize throughout the talk that edge is not the cloud. Uh, you might have heard uh, of the cloud uh, and, uh, you know, and the fact that it has many deployments. Uh, usually clouds don't have as many different locations as the edge. Uh, those deployments uh, may not be necessarily close to end users. 
Um, and also the concept of a cloud is location dependent in the sense that you have something on the East Coast, something on the West Coast, something in Europe. Uh, edge is sort of omnipresent in the sense that it's not, when you deploy something on the edge, you're not deploying it at any, any particular location. The idea is that that service will show up where you need it to show up and be close to you. And that's that's what an edge is. Okay. I seem to be having some trouble moving this. Okay. Um, so the best place to start is maybe look at what an edge looks like. Um, so I want to start with the Akamai edge, uh, which arguably is perhaps the, you know, the most widely deployed edge that's out there. Um, it has something like 360,000 servers. Uh, it's uh, located in more than a more than 4,000 locations. Uh, it's in more, you know, more than 1,000 networks, uh, lots of cities, uh, lots of different countries. Um, and you know, this really speaks to the ubiquity of, of the edge. So in most major cities, you would find um, you know, 80 to 100, or maybe even more than 100 different edge locations. Um, um, and, and that's the sort of thing that, that, that we talk about when we talk about the edge. OK, so I want to tell the story in four different chapters. Uh, I want to first talk about how the edge originated um, in the context of content delivery. Uh, and then I want to talk about how that led into edge computing services. Um, then I want to talk about how the edge became so important that, you know, a lot of the most important things were behind the edge and you needed to defend the edge. Um, and finally, I'll say a little bit forward looking, uh, about, you know, how to build a zero carbon edge. Okay. So that's going to be sort of the structure of what I'm going to present, you know, in four different parts. So let's start with the first part. So I want you to think back. Uh, 25 years ago, um, what the internet looked like. Um, you know, there was no edge back then. And if you wanted to access content on the internet back then, uh, this used to be the process. So on the left side here, I hope you can see my cursor. There is something we will call origin. So you can think of the origin as something that a content provider would want. What I mean by that is a content provider is somebody like CNN, or New York Times, they have some content. Uh, or it could be something that an application provider owns. For example, a bank who has a banking application uh, or a video provider like Hulu or Netflix. Uh, you know, a content provider is somebody who has content or applications. Uh, and, uh, you know, they would have an, uh, some infrastructure which you would call the origin. And then you as a client would be sitting here. And this is my internet bubble. And when you want to fetch something from uh, this origin, you would go through this process. You'd go into your browser, you would type something in into your browser, and then you know your browser goes forward across the internet. Uh, you know, could be a long distance over the internet and gets the HTML page. Uh, and then you would make a sequence of further requests to get whatever is inside that page, which we'll call embedded content. So this is how the internet used to work before the edge that you had all these long distance communications from the end user uh, to a customer origin. What is the problem with this? The problem with this is that this is not very reliable um, and it's not highly performing either because you're making uh, you know, two round trips to get the HTML, you need to form the connection and then you need to go get the HTML and then the embedded content may take you know, some more rounds of communication across the internet. So it's not highly performing. It's also not scalable because if you have a flash crowd of users who all come in and want to access the same content, all of a sudden the customer origin is not able to tackle that problem. So the, this, this used to be the situation before the edge came about. And really CDN 1.0, if you will, uh, and really the reason the edge was born uh, some 25 years ago is to solve this problem. And the way it solved this problem is you deploy servers on the edge close to end users. And when you do that, you can do the following. When a user wants to actually access content, they, they still go and fetch the HTML from the origin. That's still a long, long trip. 
But observe that whatever is inside the page, like the images that you see in the page, all of the stuff is really cacheable. It doesn't change much. It's embedded content. It doesn't change much. Those things could just come from an edge that is close to you, right? Um, so this is really CDN 1.0, where uh, all the embedded content is cl cached close to you, and you get that content uh, from an edge, right? Um, so you know, let's look look and see what CDN 1.0 can do. Um, you have very short round trips to get the embedded content. You still have to go, go to the origin for the HTML, but you can make quick round trips to get the content that's embedded within the page. The origin is being offloaded because these edge servers are taking up a bulk of the work because you know the embedded content is always rich content. You know, it's much bigger than the web, the base web page. And things are now scalable, much more scalable because uh, you know, the load can be distributed across this edge. So this is really the conception, and this is really the reason the edge was born. Now, there is actually a tricky thing here. It's not so easy to build even CDN 1.0 because every client in the world, and there, are, and there were a lot of clients even back in the late 90s. By the way, I'll give some timelines here just to give you a sense of when the first version of these services were built. Uh, of course, these services are not static and, you know, there's been lots of work and some of these things are, you know, still being researched and made better. But this this just gives you a sense of, you know, uh, you know, what the, what the timeline timeline is. Um, so, um, so this, you know, this actually involves an interesting problem, which is uh, every client you need the ability to say who is the nearest edge who's the nearest best edge who can serve that particular client and nearest could be in network networking terms it could be the smallest latency for example okay so we we created this process called mapping which is essentially a very interesting problem which is for every client in the world and there are lots of them what is the nearest server, edge server that is closest to them? And really building the mapping system uh, at Akamai actually drove a lot of major advances in internet measurement uh, in, in the late 90s, and it still continues today. The first thing you need to know to be able to do something like this is what, what I call IP intelligence. That is, you need to be able to look at an IP and say, this IP is located in this place. It, it is in this AS. Uh, it, is, it has this kind of connectivity. Uh, and you need to be able to classify where a specific client is. And that by itself is an interesting research problem. And, you know, there are lots of products. We, we first built something called Edgescape, which, which was a geolocation product. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on even today on how to locate IPs and, you know, learn more about, you know, what they are. Um, a second interesting problem that you need to be able to do mapping well is you need to be able to understand the internet weather. You need to be, you need to understand, monitor and understand the internet in its entirety. Uh, the little pieces of it, uh, as you know, the internet has, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of networks connected to each other. You need to kind of understand the global picture in nearly real time by doing pings and trace routes and accumulating that information because you need to be able to say, for every user, what is the best server that that you know that that user can be served from? So, a lot of the internet telemetry and uh, measurement and analysis systems were built in this context. And finally, there were a lot of interesting algorithms that needed to be built. Uh, so, uh, to be able to match clients with servers. Um, you needed to build load balancing algorithms, and we used a lot of interesting, uh, you know, theoretical work on stable marriage uh, and um, consistent hashing, you know, to do things like that. Uh, by the way, with all of these things, we actually written papers in various places to kind of describe these systems in greater detail. Uh, and I've kind of noted a few. There are a couple of papers we wrote in SICOM in the past few years about mapping and DNS and the algorithmic work we actually. I had a paper called Algorithmic Nuggets, which uh, which kind of described the algorithms that go into these systems. Okay. So, you know, as technical people, I think we tend to kind of emphasize the technical advances uh, more perhaps than business advances, but I would like to make maybe a little bit of a 
more controversial case that Syrians exist today, not so much because of the technical advances that we were able to make, but because of some business innovations. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So clearly, as we saw, caching provides value. If you can cache things close to the user, you can improve performance, right? And the classical model for caching in those days was what we, we would call the caching provider model, where you're a company, you may be building cache caches, either software or actual hardware, and you would go to a network provider or an ISP and you would sell that to the network provider. You'd say, okay, I can give you, I can provide you caching software or I could provide you a caching appliance. And that's the service you provide to the network provider. And the network provider, you pay, pay you for that service because caching actually decreases the traffic on their backbone. So this was the classic model, the caching provider model. And there were many people who were really caching providers in those days, in the late 1990s. And when Akamai came along, you know, our first early business plans was to be a caching provider. But then we flipped the plan completely around and created a different model, which is what we call the content delivery network model. And so in this model, it works a little differently. So the content delivery is the middle person here. And the content delivery network does not provide a service to the network provider, but rather to the content provider, the person who owns the content. So if you think about, for example, CNN and Comcast, so Com Comcast would be more like a network provider and, and you know, CNN would be a content provider. The content delivery network will sell its services not to Comcast, but to the content provider. So they would go to the content provider and we would say, you're going to speed up your content and you can pay us for that. See, it just turns the business model on its head. And the content delivery network would go to a network provider and say, can you host my servers? And for that service and for the bandwidth usage, the content delivery network would provide the net, you know, will actually pay the network provider. So this is actually a different model that turns things on its head. Now, which is a better way of doing, doing this? Um, the jury was still out, even as of 2000, uh, there were some people who believed that the caching provider model is the right way to do. And there were companies like Intermi and Cashflow and a bunch of other, you know, network appliance, you know, these are all companies that used to exist. And this New York Times article was actually comparing Akamai with Intermi in this case, but generally the comparison is between the CDN business model and the uh, caching business model. And the CDN business model turned out to be extremely fruitful and it continued to thrive. Many of the caching companies, uh, you know, changed their business model and started to do other things and so on. So why did the CDN business model succeed? I think there are two reasons. The first reason is the content provider cares much more about how their content is delivered and the performance of that content than a network word. So you're actually asking the person who cares most to pay for the service. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is actually pretty interesting. Caching is a limited business. Um, there's only so many things you can cache. If you really want to, you know, get into the business of, uh, you know, web performance or application performance, it's a lot more than just caching. So having a CDN business model kind of frees you from just doing caching. I'll get to both these points later. All right. I do want to mention one thing uh, quickly before I go on. And this is also sort of along the same lines as, um, you know, as, uh, as you know, it's, it's probably more of a business innovation. Uh, you might be thinking you're a startup company and you need to deploy an edge uh, and, and you, you're probably cash trapped and you don't actually know how to do it. You need a lot of money to deploy sort of a all pervasive edge system. What do you do? And an interesting idea came around. Uh, it was called Akamai Accelerated Network Partners uh, and AAMP. And the idea was as follows. You don't always have to pay the network provider for co-location and bandwidth. You could do the following. You could go to an eyeball network, a small network, uh, like you know, uh, an educational institution or government or a small ISP, and you could tell them, look, I want to deploy servers in your network. You're going to see 
a big decrease in your upstream bandwidth because you don't have to pull in the content lots of times. So when someone goes to access CNN, we'll just pull in the content once and serve it to a lot of people. So you're going to see a decrease in your upstream bandwidth and you're going to pay less for it upstream bandwidth. In return, why don't you give my bandwidth for free and my rack space for free and my co-location for free? And this is really the swap. And the swap really worked. And this is how Akamai sort of was able to deploy in lots of places, on campuses, and so on. And I think right now, this kind of a swap model uh, has become you know, relatively popular. I know that Netflix uh, started to do it, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Anyway, I just wanted to point out that there are some business-related things and uh, that really you know, uh, you know, take a technology forward. Okay, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, again, we are in the topic of CDN 1.0, where you're caching. Um, selling this to customers is always a challenge. Um, when you go to a content provider and say, can you speed up my website? Um, we can speed it up by a, by a big amount. They usually say, show it to me, right? Uh, because everyone's web property is different. And they really want to see that it actually works for them. And so the traditional thing we used to do is to go and measure, and it's called a customer trial, where we measure the download performance with and without the CDN. So this, this is actually from 1999. This is really from the olden days. You can see that the web is pretty slow without the edge. Could take up to 15 seconds to download certain things. And we would actually download it with the CDN and without the CDN. And this is with the CDN. And the, and the top line is without the CDN and show that there is a big performance improvement. Uh, that's how CDNs were sold. And that's how the SLAs were written as well. The, the SLAs would read something like, we will provide you a 1.5x increase in performance over the origin. And we will always be up uh, as long as your the origin is up. That's the kind of SLA that, that would go with the CDN. And we wrote the, the, the first SLAs for the CDNs, and I think it still continues that way. Uh, you know, besides performance and reliability, there's also a scalability benefit. Uh, the edge is, so, is, is really everywhere. So you can actually absorb big uh, flash crowds of traffic. And really, I could give a lot of examples. This is an example from the 2000 presidential election that actually a lot of people wanted to go on the web uh, and 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 watch the results. Uh, you couldn't have scaled without a CDN. Uh, so you know this this red bar really indicates what your origins capacity might be like. But the CDN would actually let you scale above that because you know the, the edges edge is numerous, and so you can actually distribute the load across in you know, a lot more servers. And there are lots of examples of scalability. I think most of the Big events in the world were enabled by CDNs, you know, starting from large video events, uh, Super Bowls, Olympics, and so on. So, uh, you know, every few months, there's always a new record of, you know, a bigger, bigger event being hosted on CDNs. Okay, so I want to go into CDN 2.0 uh, and talk a little bit about what, you know, what CDN 2.0 is all about. So the CDN 2.0 is really the observation that um, you can't cache everything. Uh, there has to be HTML coming from origin, but CDN 2.0, what it tries to do is it tries to deliver even the HTML from the edge. So that was really, really the, really sort of the innovation in the second version of CDNs is that even the non-cacheable HTML is served by the edge. And so you see the HTML, you know, you go to the edge to fetch it, and then from the edge, you go to the origin to fetch it. Um, you know, the embedded content, the yellow stuff still comes from the edge, uh, but you're terminating all client connections at the edge. And really, this gives you a few advantages. I mean, there's always an advantage to have the HTML go through your edge, uh, but it also gives you the ability to prefetch content. For example, when the HTML is downloaded, you can look at all the embedded pages and fetch them out of time if you want. And, and also you can maintain persistent connections between the edge and the origin, so you don't have to do connection setup. So there are some, you know, some advantages already, but maybe the most important advantage is that we built overlay routing for the non-cacheable content. And that was really probably uh, one of the one of the most important things we were able to do is that uh, 
if, if this direct path from the origin to the edge is not working, we could take these indirect dotted paths to go back to origin. And so the, or, you know, or, you know, I think academia was also um, uh, researching overlays at that time, uh, and Akamai was also building these things. Uh, it was called Sure Route, which was really an overlay for web content. So I want to actually emphasize one interesting thing and one interesting milestone in the story of the edge. Um, one of the important things that we, we had always wanted to do was to host financial transactions on CDNs. And that was hard because one had to use, you know, in those days SSL and in, and in these days TLS. And if you really wanted to do what I just said for if your origin was a bank and you needed a secure connection, you need to be able to terminate that secure connection at the edge, which means you needed the private keys of the bank at the edge, right? So that you can, you can actually terminate TLS and SSL. This was actually a big problem because banks and financial institutions won't want to give a third party CDN, uh, you know, their, 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 you know, their private keys. Right. So there's a lot of interesting engineering work that needed to go to make the edge to be PCI compliant, which is the payment credit card industry compliance. Um, you needed to do things like uh, you, you needed to build secure mechanisms to actually hold third party uh, certificates and keys. And you needed to build um, an edge infrastructure that could be in a locked cage, perhaps. Uh, and you could have cameras monitoring it. Uh, the software should be designed so that, you know, private keys are never returned to disk. Uh, you needed to be able to wipe your server immediately if something happens. Uh, you needed to have a key management infrastructure to manage all the keys on the network. So there's a lot of engineering that had to, had to, had, you know, had to happen before a bank would say, okay, I would use a CDN. Right. And so I really view that as a big milestone because today, you know, all the banks use CDN-like infrastructure, but it wasn't easy getting there. I mean, you had to actually build all these extra things to get there. Um, I haven't talked about video at all. Uh, video is actually a big part of everything that we do. Uh, in fact, most of the most of the uh, you know bits on the C on a CDN is videos. Um, we built some of the earliest video platforms, uh, both on-demand and live. The on-demand actually looks something like this. Uh, it looks a lot like a traditional CDN, except that we built a net storage cloud. Uh, back in those days, clouds weren't a thing. Um, uh, if, you, if you recall, this is all pre-cloud. Uh, the compute cloud and the storage cloud, Amazon's uh, compute and storage cloud, uh, came out in 2006. And so we are really talking about days before the cloud. And uh, this was the storage cloud uh, that we built. The, the primary purpose of this cloud is to store videos. It was a B2B cloud. Uh, and it was also an early instance of the cloud edge architecture that we talk about these days, where there is a cloud that stores the videos, and then there's an edge to actually distribute the videos. And this is one of the early, so this, this picture was functional in 2000. And this was really one of the earliest instances, I think, of, of the cloud edge model. Um, so, okay, so that's really a quick, uh, you know, quick uh, summary of what, what videos are. Uh, I want to actually switch to this topic of edge computing. So what is edge computing? Uh, edge computing is really the concept that you could have applications running on the edge, not just content, but applications. And uh, I want to say how edge computing involved sort of as a direct extension of content delivery and also a logical extension of content delivery. So, uh, you know, if you think about what content delivery did, let's look at what is inside an origin location. An origin location will have a web server. Uh, it'll have an app server for the application logic and it will have some database, backend databases. This is what an origin infrastructure look like, looks like. If you think about what content delivery did, it took this web infrastructure and pushed some of that to the edge. So that's what content delivery is. And really looking at this picture, it, it is pretty obvious that if you really want to go further, you really have to take what is in the app servers and maybe some of what is in the databases and push it to the edge. So really, even from the get-go, even in the early days of CDN, uh, we always had sort of the 
edge computing as the holy grail. And people would ask us, you know, what are you going to do after content delivery? And we would always say, we want to do applications on the edge. Um, but that didn't come to reality in the very early years. Uh, it really came in step by step uh, over a period of three years. And I want to describe what those steps were. Uh, there was something that happened in 2000 and then 2001 and then, and then in 2002. So let me kind of explain this whole process of how uh, we pushed computation to the edge. Really the first way we push computation to the edge is what I call metadata. Uh, it's really in the context of content delivery. People were wanting to do very complex things with their content. They were wanting to transform it, uh, cache it for different amounts of time. There's a lot of logic that went into uh, actually caching and serving a content. And we built this programming language uh, called metadata. Um, it started out relatively simple, but it soon became a Turing complete language that you could write all sorts of interesting things in it. Uh, the basic way that it worked was uh, it would look at the stream of requests coming in and it would extract features of the request and then it would take some action. So this is an example of what metadata looks like. Uh, it's an XML language that could be executed on the edge. And it's a sequence of rules. And this is actually not from 2000, but really a more modern uh, version of metadata where what this is doing is it's looking at a client, it's looking at the fingerprint of a client, and then it's taking action based on that fingerprint. It's doing a sort of a firewall-like action. So this is what metadata looks like, where you can write metadata and it executes on the edge. It executes a sequence of rules uh, associated with the traffic. So this, this, I would say, is really the first step towards edge computing. A second step is actually a little more advanced, I would say. I wouldn't say advanced, a little different. Uh, if you notice this web page here, um, almost everything in this web page is cacheable except maybe this little thing over here uh, that's really customized to the user. So almost everything here is cacheable, even the base page. Uh, and there's just this little piece there uh, that's not cacheable. So if you look at this, you can say, hey, you know what? we really shouldn't be assembling the web page on the origin, we can do that at the edge. And that was what we called ESI or edge side includes. It's a markup language in HTML, which basically says, you know, you can assemble this whole page on the edge. Uh, there is just that little piece, which is really customized to the user that you could get from origin. And so this ESI language became a standard in 2001. It was supported by IBM WebSphere and other people. And uh, this was really like, you know, a second version of what I would call edge computing. The third version is really, I think, true edge computing. I mean, so far you can say this is advanced content delivery, but true edge computing emerged in 2002. Um, uh, we coined the name edge computing in 2001, uh, and the service that was called edge computing uh, was launched in 2002. Uh, Akuma had a trademark for the name edge computing from 2002 to 2011. Um, at around 2011, other people were building edge computing, uh, you know, applications on the edge. And edge computing sort of became a generic name where any, any kind of application executing the edge would be called edge computing. And so in 2001, 2011, Akuma did not, uh, you know, get, you know, you know reassign the trademark because it, the name had become generic. And so how did this work? And this, I think, is true edge computing. The, the way it works is you take an application and you divide it into two parts. This is your application. You divide it into two parts. One part is run, will run in the origin and the other part will run on the edge. And, uh, and, and, and you could also move some of the relational data to the edge. So this was the conception that you could actually have two, two parts and they could communicate with each other and that way you're shifting some of the computational logic to the edge. And you're also keeping, you're also bringing this computational logic close to the client side data, which, which is also something that you want. So this is edge computing as it was built earlier. And people invent, you know, people implemented a lot of interesting things using this, this concept, concept. For example, one of the early uses in 2002 was running a contest on the edge where Logitech ran a contest uh, you know, they, was, they were giving, you know, cordless mouses and keyboards. I don't think we have seen one, one of these in, in decades. Uh, and there were 72 million participants and the Java application ran on the edge. The benefit really was that it was scalable. They, don't, they didn't need to really 
worry about scaling it because the edge was there. Uh, there were other kinds of applications that were run in that time frame. For example, this is an, this is an example where uh, a phone configurator was run on the edge. Uh, so, you know, configurating the phone, uh, shopping cart, dealer locator, a suite of mobile applications where it was, was implemented on the edge. Um, and the benefit really is that you're offloading computation from the origin and the mobile client to the edge. So these are all examples from the past. And this one is actually a really interesting example where uh, this is for IBS, uh, implemented in 2003, where users would be watching TV shows and providing sort of real-time input. Uh, you know, is the show good or not? That data would flow to the edge and then, you know, would then get aggregated and flow back into the origin. You can see that this is actually not content delivery at all because the data is in fact flowing in the opposite direction. And I just pulled up sort of, um, you know, a, a product document from 2004 to see what kind of applications were running. And really, there were a lot of rich applications, you know, applications that are CPU sensitive, uh, that needed sort of a special performance requirements, that had scalability challenges, you know, all of these things were, were running in the edge. Okay, coming, coming forward to the current moment, I wanted to give you a sense of what kind of things run in edge computing today. And uh, IoT is something that is really, really well suited for the edge. Uh, because as I said, the edge is everywhere. And, you know, and there are more devices than people these days on the internet. You know, by devices, I mean automobiles, appliances, medical devices, thermostats, sensors. These were the things that are, are on the internet right now. And the edge, um, something, something like the Akamai edge would be pretty close to a lot of these devices. And so it makes a lot of sense that IoT should do its transactions on the edge. So one quick example I'll give is, uh, you know, IoT devices have uh, a lightweight client broker protocol called MQTT, where devices can actually publish on certain topics and other devices can subscribe to those topics. It's a pub sub kind of model. And this pub sub model needs a broker in the middle to connect up the publishers with the subscribers. And the edge is kind of ideally suited for that because the edge is actually near the devices. And so there is an MQTT broker, a distributed MQTT broker running on the edge, uh, which can hook up you know, different IoT clients. And you can do all sorts of fancy things with it. For example, if you're driving in a car, you can communicate with other cars that are close to you. For example, you could be saying, you know, there is IC roads and some other car could be subscribing to those messages and doing some action based on that. So this is a classic example of how the edge is being used currently. Uh, there are other examples that I would like to give, which is sort of a serverless computing example on the edge. Uh, so as you know, if you look at this picture, as the client is transacting with the edge and the origin, you can actually do computation based on different things. For example, you can do a computation based on uh, uh, when the client comes in. Uh, you can do a computation based on uh, a request going back to origin. You can do a computation uh, based on the response. So you can actually associate computations with the events that are happening on the edge. It's really just a JavaScript uh, computation that gets triggered every time an event happens on the edge. And using that, you can do a lot of interesting computations on the edge. For example, you can do A-B testing uh, of users. Uh, you can have a waiting room application, for example, uh, that queues people up uh, at the edge. Uh, you can do things like encryption uh, and uh, other sorts of complex things. So this is actually a sort of a serverless computing kind of approach uh, or functions as a service approach that 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 is pretty popular, uh, which is uh, which is running on the edge. Okay, so these are all different flavors of edge computing. Uh, some some old ones and some new ones. Uh, the principles really haven't changed much over the years, uh, but the way in which you invoke these services have. I want to spend a little bit of time now going to sort of the third part of my presentation, which really is defending the edge. So at some point, you know, all of us realized that this edge is so important, you know, pretty much all the important things were inside the edge. Uh, and you had to access the edge to get to those services, whether it's banks or governments, they're all sitting inside the edge. So we started to view the edge sort of as a gatekeeper for the rest of the internet. And I use this picture here with a, with a castle and a moat. Uh, the edge is kind of like a moat 
uh, around the castle, which has a lot of valuable things in it. So the first version of this approach of thinking about the edge as sort of a gatekeeper for services was actually, it actually has also a history. Uh, back in 2001, uh, we thought about something called Site Shield, which is really, um, you know, the edge, uh, and you would have things inside the edge, uh, like banks and e-commerce and government, and the edge could serve as a gatekeeper for anyone who's entering. So, the, you know, the edge would, it can do things like uh, allow only certain ports to get in, uh, it could do, you know, blocking based on IP and geo. There might be some malicious users who, who could get blocked at the edge. And, and the origin site sitting in the middle will only talk to the edge. It will not talk to anyone else. So that way it's protected from talking to anyone, anybody outside. So this was really the conception of Site Shield. Uh, but back in those days, there really weren't huge DDoS attacks and things like that. But as you know, things have been getting really bad these days uh, where... Uh, every day, you know, you open the newspaper and there is there is some sort of an attack going on. And attacks have been kind of increasing in an exponential way. Uh, either they try to overwhelm uh, the, the website or the application or, and they try to penetrate the edge. So, and in fact, you can even quantify it. If you look at the DDoS attacks that, uh, that we've seen uh, over the past few years, um, they've been increasing not just in the number of DDoS attacks, but also in the intensity. You can see this red color here, which is you know DDoS, DDoS attacks that are really, really large, right? More than 500 gigabits per second of DDoS attacks. Um, you know, one terabit per second is actually enough to bring down an entire country, for example, right? So uh, I'm a small country, <laughs> not a big country. Uh, so you know, the attacks have been really on the rise. So this is uh, this is a problem. Uh, and really, these attacks work as cyber extortion sometimes, where you know this is an actual ransom note that you would get. Uh, basically, somebody saying, I'm going to bring down your network. You have to pay me in Bitcoin. That's not tra traceable. If you, just not, if you don't pay, we will start the attack. So this has become really, really common these days. And how can the edge stop these attacks? And that's really the conception of what we call uh, a distributed web application firewall. The idea is that you can take a firewall-like functionality and distribute it at the edge. So the edge will act as a firewall when someone comes in and this client is a reasonable client, they would actually get through and be able to access the origin. Uh, but if you are actually an attacker, uh, the firewall will try to actually figure that out and, and kind of give you a forbidden. So the firewall uh, at the edge acts as sort of a so sort of a defense. You know, it's pretty much the way a moat acts as a defense for, uh, you know, you know, for the castle, right? So let me give you a little more insight on, on how that works. Uh, so, so the way to think about it is when a client comes in at the edge, you can actually have a lot of different controls at the edge. For example, you could have a rate control, which kind of tries to figure out, you know, are you, how many requests you're sending? Uh, are you sending them in bursts? Uh, how does it correspond to historically uh, what you've sent in the past? Uh, you can have rules to detect specific kinds of things like cross, you know, cross-site scripting or SQL injection or PHP. Uh, and you can also compute something which we call the reputation of a client. It's a little bit like your credit score. Uh, when you go in, people look at a credit score and say, okay, uh, this is a summary of all the financial transactions you've done in the past. So reputation is a little bit like that. So a, C, a large CDN can maintain kind of a reputation score that basically says, is this person malicious? Is this person not? Okay. Uh, another quick example of, you know, doing security at the edge is bot management. As you know, uh, there are good bots, there are bad bots, and really bots have also been on the increase. And in fact, the malicious bots that we show here in the red have been increasing more than the benign ones. Uh, and the question is, how do you intelligently manage them? And the edge actually is a good place to manage bots. And if you look at the bots, the picture of the bots, you know, bots are essentially doing, you know, transactions of various sorts. There are good ones. For example, uh, they could be spidering a website uh, for a search engine. And there are bad ones. Uh, you know, for example, they could be trying to log into your website with credentials that are stolen from somewhere. And so, and sort of an interesting kind of research area and also a place where things are being implemented is intelligent detection of bots at the edge. So, you know, this is an example of how the edge could use ML 
uh, to figure things out. You know, it could use reputation, network, device fingerprinting, session behavior to figure out what kind of bot it is. And each bot requires a different response. If it's a hacker bot, you'd probably want to just stop access. If it's a search engine bot from Google or someone like that, you want to respond quickly. There are lots of things in between. So this is an example of using the edge to do things like bot detection. Okay, I want to just spend a few minutes on uh, sustainable computing. So, so far, everything I've talked about is things that are already implemented either historically or you know, currently implemented. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit of the future. Uh, this is really much more at the research stage. And so the problem is the edge has become so prevalent uh, and the internet demand is only increasing and the edge traffic is, is also only increasing. And this is what Akamai's edge traffic looks like. You can see for the past, uh, for the past few years, you can see sort of the COVID bump here, uh, but then you know, it's just continuing to increase. So edge traffic is just going up, uh, you know, it's currently at you know, 250 terabits per second, um, which means the energy usage is going up and the carbon footprint is also going up. So the, the goal for us sort of in, from a research perspective is to figure out if it's possible to power the edge entirely using renewables and and what you know what we're realizing is that doing something like that needs us to redesign the edge from scratch to make carbon the first design principle i don't have a lot of time to go into all all the all, you know, all the different ideas here i just want to present a couple quick ones the first idea we're thinking about is what we call follow the renewables mapping if you remember i said mapping is the process of taking a client and finding the nearest edge server now, if I change the problem just a little bit and say, can we map a client to the nearest edge server that has renewables that are available? So maybe there are two edge servers, one of them is cloudy, and so there's no renewables being produced there, and this one is sunny and there's renewables being produced there. Can I change mapping so that it actually is aware of the weather, both the internet weather and the actual weather? Uh, and, and be sensitive to where renewables are being produced. And we did a, sm a small study which basically said that if you remap people, because CDNs are so, the edge is so per pervasive, there are 60 or 70 places always that are you know, equally, equally good in terms of performance, uh, that gives us the ability to select one you know, based on carbon, for example. And we saw that you can actually end up decreasing um, uh, you know, carbon intensity by 40%. This is still sort of in, in research phase. This is one idea. The other idea is really to kind of rethink what an edge should be. Um, if you do look at traditional data centers, they're very energy dense. Uh, so if you have a hundred megawatt data center, it needs 450 acres of solar to really power it, right? But we could build micro data centers that are completely carbon zero carbon neutral. So for example, here is a mass zero data center. It's powered by solar. It has lithium batteries uh, when, it's, when there is no solar production to keep the servers running. So this is a small data center uh, that's completely carbon free. And one of the questions that we're thinking about is, could we build an edge based on zero carbon data centers? There has to be lots of them. There would be micro data centers. How would we really even build that? So this is something we're thinking about. And with those thoughts, uh, let me uh, let me just pause here. I hope that this gives you a quick, a very quick summary of stuff going on at the edge, uh, you know, over the past twenty five years or so. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I, I would also say that um, uh, many of we have published on many of these things, and you know, my publications page actually has uh, uh, different aspects of it. You know, we published on edge computing. Uh, mapping and other sorts of components that I talked about. Thank you. Great. So thanks so much, Ramesh. Let's all give sort of a virtual round of applause. That was really fascinating. Um, we'd encourage people to ask questions in the Q&A. There's uh, seven of them there now. And, and so Ramesh, if it's okay with you, Matt and I are going to sort of alternate asking you questions that have come up through the Q&A, and then we may have a couple of our own also. Um, okay. So maybe that's how we'll get the questions to you. Uh, let me let me start off. One of the questions there are actually a couple of questions that came in when you were talking about um, 
uh, financial services being delivered from the edge. One about keys, which I think you 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 uh, answered a little bit later. There was one question that came in about synchronization, especially since you can deliver a service from multiple sites and there's multiple, you know, there may be a single piece of data that somebody needs. Um, what are the synchronization issues around that? How do you solve those kinds of questions? Right. So that's a very good question. Um, so you could either have a database at the edge uh, that can synchronize across clusters. Um, it would be a full-fledged database. Or you could have something a little bit simpler, which is a key value store, right? So some of the, the, the serverless applications that I talked about where uh, somebody would just write JavaScript uh, and then uh, the edge will execute that JavaScript. Um, that actually is tied up to what is something called edge KV or edge key value store. Uh, it can basically uh, keep key values stored at the edge. And there has to be sort of synchronization primitives and consistency uh, uh, model, uh, something like an eventual consistency model, for example, uh, so that the key values could store at different locations on the edge can all kind of synchronize with, with each other. So that's a good question. So you need to be able to build, when you build edge computing, you need to be able to build some way of storing the data and having it synced up uh, both across servers within a cluster, but also across the cluster. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a, a, another question uh, from the chat. Um, if we look at uh, inter-AS routing protocols, we know that BGP makes its route decisions based on the AS hop count uh, without knowledge of latencies or real-time congestion of the underlying networks. Uh, and we know Akamai has a much more powerful system, which does measurements and probes and things like that. Uh, we're wondering if you could talk about how that mapping system works a little bit and how it's used to dynamically optimize paths. Right. So the mapping system uh, works by uh, we have some we have some publications on this that you can look at for some more detail. But essentially, that mapping system works by measuring the internet from the edge deployments to uh, clients around the world. So the measurements are done using pings and trace routes um, and you take that real-time measurement and then you combine it with BGP data that can give you sort of AS and AS hop information and maybe even some geo data. And you can combine all of that to produce sort of a real-time map of which client should go to which server. Uh, and this map is actually done at two levels. The first kind of map is what we call a top level map, which basically says which cluster it should go to. We call that map to cluster. And then within the cluster, there is the question of which server you go to, which is mapped to server. So that there, there are two different processes uh, and they, are, they all work through DNS and TTLs. Uh, and so the TTL for the lower one is something like 20 seconds, which means that uh, because things change quickly, you can change those assignments quickly. Okay, great. We, we had another question, Ramesh, that came up about uh, defenses against DDoS. Uh, attacks and um, uh, obviously the lar those large actually it was really interesting to see some of the data that you published uh, or that you posted here uh, about the size and scale and numbers of those attacks and the question that that came in said uh, I assume there that large DDoS attacks can have multiple adversarial clients but um, but the way you sort of presented the solution you're looking at uh, the reputation and the rate of singular clients. And isn't there some notion about authenticity or clusters of clients on beyond just individual clients? Right. In, in terms of uh, DDoS attacks, I think uh, uh, groups of clients matter more than single users. Right. Uh, single user reputation matters more for attacks that are trying to penetrate. I, I really see two kinds of attacks. One is sort of volumetric attacks that try to kind of uh, completely blow you out. And then there is sort of the penetration attacks that come in and want to just grab stuff. Uh, I think the personal reputation is really, the client reputation stuff is really more relevant there. But for DDoS attacks, you're absolutely right. Uh, you have to be thinking about groups of users trying to get in uh, and trying to look for attack signatures and trying to 
understand things like rate control. Can we rate control them or we could send them to some other place? Um, and you also need to have a lot of spare capacity. I said that there were some attacks that are more than 500 gigabits per second, but a large CDN like Akamai uh, does 250 terabits per second. So it's, it's an even bigger thing. And so you need to have attack capacity in place to kind of suck those attacks as well. Okay, so so maybe one you you talked about signatures there are 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 there just to uh, push the question a little bit a little bit deeper when you're thinking about volumetric attacks when you say limiting sort of sets of clients then you're looking for what maybe you could just say a word about what a signature might look like to say oh these are you know this is a distributed set of clients doing a volume attack right for example if it's a bot network that is actually trying to do the attack, uh, then you might be able to find uh, a signature for that bot. Uh, so the bot might be using uh, a certain sequencer requests. Uh, it, it might be using certain timing aspects. Uh -huh. uh, so essentially you try to classify um, you know, the behavioral aspects uh, of, of, of the bot um, sometimes you can fingerprint the devices they are coming from. Uh, so that isn't like a single answer and, uh, it's really a cat and mouse game, obviously. Um, and, uh, you're really trying to infer, uh, you know, infer that they're all the same, you know, it's part of the same attack, uh, based on a lot of different features, uh, that can vary from, um, where these attacks are coming from, what devices they might be, uh, the timing sequences that are displayed during the attack. Uh, you suck in a lot of features and you know machine learning is obviously used uh, in kind of classifying what you know what kind of attack, uh -huh. it, attack it is. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, uh, there's another question uh, that was asked about the potential impact if an Akamai edge server were to be compromised and uh, what sort of security measures are in place. Are you able to talk about that? Right. So I did talk about things like server wipe, where if something gets compromised, first of all, there are a lot of defenses so that it doesn't get compromised. Uh, I think uh, I, I talked about uh, you know, monitoring using cameras and you know the software itself that doesn't write anything to disk and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, it's possible to completely sever the network, uh, sever the server from the rest of the network, uh, very quickly. It's possible to wipe the server very quickly. Uh, you know, those are the kind of things that, 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 that can be done if there is a compromise. Okay, great. Um, so I think we're out of time. So, uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ramesh for this, uh, super interesting, uh, talk. Um, to finish up, we wanted to remind everybody uh, that the conversation will continue on the Slack. Um, we're going to post the uh, Slack join information in the in the chat here. Um, so uh, please join and continue asking questions. Uh, we also want to remind you that the networking channel is not just one talk. It is a series of talks and all our talks are free of charge and open to everybody. So please feel very welcome to join and attend in the future. Um, this is going to be the last talk of the year. We're going to take a break for a few weeks, and then the next talk is going to be on January 18th. And the topic of this next topic, uh, of the next topic is going to be on networking in the continent of Africa, connectivity, education, and research topics. So it should be a really interesting uh, discussion. So with that, uh, thank you everybody very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in January. Thank you. Thanks again, Ramesh. Thanks.